All right, thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, welcome officially to everybody. My name is Jen Tang, and I'm the Director for Federal and Community Relations at Berkeley Lab. Since our founding in 1931 by a young physics professor named Ernest Orlando Lawrence, Berkeley Lab has been dedicated to advancing the scope of human knowledge and seeking science solutions to some of the greatest problems facing humankind. We're celebrating the lab's 90th birthday this year, and to mark the occasion, we've developed a range of content, including podcasts, virtual tours, historical highlights, and this speaker series, all intended to shine a spotlight on the lab's unique approach to team-based and pioneering discovery science. As we reflect on our past achievements and imagine what the next 90 years might have in store for us, we invite you to join in on our celebration. We'll put a link in the chat to our 90th anniversary website where you can explore all of the different features and events. Our researchers are excited to talk with you today about how they're using machine learning to advance and enable scientific uh, experiments across a multitude of fields. And before we get started, I just want to cover a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, we are recording today's webinar, so people who are unable to watch it live can access it later on the lab's YouTube channel. There will be a Q&A session following the speaker's presentations, so please submit any questions you have for our presenters at any time using either the chat or the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. And before I introduce our first speaker, I just want to thank my colleagues in the Government and Community Relations Office, Strategic Communications Office, and in our IT office for their help putting this lecture together. With that, let me stop sharing screen and let you know that it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Kathy Yellick. Kathy is a Senior Advisor on Computing at Berkeley Lab and is also the Associate Dean for Research in the Division of Computing, Data Science, and Society at UC Berkeley. Kathy, the floor is yours. Great. Well, thanks very much, Jen. And I'm really excited to be here. I think there's a really phenomenal panel of people that are going to tell you all about some of the ways that we use machine learning for different scientific projects at Berkeley Lab. I'm going to start by just giving a little bit of an overview of, kind of what's different about machine learning and science and just a little bit about how it works and what we need in order to do machine learning for science. So machine learning has changed a lot of things about our lives around us, about how we shop for things, the fact that they will sometimes put diapers next to beer in the grocery store, um, the way the sports teams are managed, the way we do um, agriculture. And, uh, but these are, you may ask, well, what is it about um, machine learning though? If you think of it mainly as something that's used for these other applications, what does it have to do with science? So um, I'm going to start with the canonical example of looking for cat videos, or at least cat images, on the internet. And machine learning algorithms can be used to analyze images and to find cats. So there's a set of different problems that can be used for. The first one we call classification, that is, is there a cat in this image? Localization, where is the cat in the image? Detection, and we can use that to count things. How many cats are there? How many other things are there? Sometimes we might not even recognize the rubber ducky, but the machine learning algorithm may be able to say, there's a bunch of things in this picture that look like an, an interesting object. And then drawing kind of a border around it, segmenting the image to say where exactly are the, the cats or the other objects. So what about science though? We're not really interested in finding cat videos so much here at Berkeley Lab, but we are interested in understanding climate change. And we use much more complicated data than images. On this screen in my PowerPoint slide, it looks like an image, but what this really is is three-dimensional simulation data of climate change. And we're looking for things like extreme climate events such as hurricanes. And we can do the same thing to say in the simulation, is there a cyclone or a hurricane? Is there, where is it? How many are there? Are there other things such as atmospheric rivers and exactly what are their boundaries? And so scientists here at the lab have extended these machine learning algorithms to look at these kinds of problems on the much more complicated scientific data that we, we uh, develop from our simulations. Now, the next thing that you may not be have thought about is that we can use machine learning for generating data as well. And um, I'm sure you've heard of fake images and fake videos and things like that. And I'm going to show you one here that was actually developed uh, by some uh, graduate students and a faculty member on the UC Berkeley campus. And this is looking at making people appear if they know how to dance. 
think that these kinds of fake videos might not be of much interest to us in science because we want real things. And one of the questions is how to generate data that's actually useful to us in science. But we can sometimes use this to very quickly de develop data that we can use to analyze a large space of things we're looking at, such as data that is explaining the um, weak gravitational lensing in the universe and trying to understand the physical laws of the universe. And these maps here of the universe were generated by machine learning algorithms using techniques somewhat like those that were used in the previous video. Now, the last thing that I'm sure you're also aware of is the idea of using, um, of automating processes like, like driving and um, self-driving cars. And we have a phrase we like to use here at the lab called self-driving laboratories. And self-driving laboratories, um, we automate things like all of the processes a scientist may use at the lab, and they can get much more precise control over experiments and things like that than you may be able to get with a, with a human being running that experiment. And also do it much more efficiently and at a much broader scale. Now, generally speaking, there are three things that we need for machine learning to make it work. We need a lot of data, we need algorithms, and we need machines, very fast machines. So we sometimes talk about all the data coming at us in science and in commercial settings and elsewhere as the big data tsunami. Um, and more specifically, you can talk about the volume of the data, the speed at which it's coming at you. So if, you're, if you've got a, a telescope or you'll hear about some of the other scientific instruments such as the advanced light source, um, that data can be coming at a very rapid rate. In fact, so fast that you can't even save it onto a disk. Um, the variety that is you might want to take a bunch of different data sets and put them together and the veracity a lot of our data in science and is very noisy and so we have to use um, algorithmic techniques to try to sort of filter through that data and figure out what is accurate data what is what is correct um, the data that we look at in science is, is, runs the spectrum from images and videos as the, the kinds of examples that you've seen here, but also into things like genomic data, signal processing data that comes from carbon sensors in the atmosphere, the simulation data, and other things. Now, this data is growing very rapidly in science, so we do have a, a, sci a data science tsunami here. Um, this shows the size of the sequencing data that the National Institutes of Health Archive is storing and how it's growing um, over time with a um, logarithmic uh, at scale here. And so there's tens of petabytes of genomic data. If you're not familiar with what a petabyte is, it's actually hard for even for any of us to really get a, a handle of that. But a petabyte would be how much data you would collect if you took 4,000 digital photos of you every day over your life, and you would be collecting a petabyte of data then. So we've got lots of scientific data. Um, we also have algorithms. So, um, and I, I put in a quote here from Arthur C. Clarke, which is any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic because sometimes it will sound like machine learning algorithms are magic. And I'm not gonna tell you in detail how they work, but I will just try, try to give you a little sense of that. So in an image problem, if we have this image here on the left, and here we've got a very simple image, and these are the pixels, and it's a black and white image. So we just have black cells that are minus one and white cells that are plus one, and we've got a picture of an X. We can, we can look for a pattern in it, such as a diagonal pattern. And we can sort of slide this pattern over the image and figure out where are the left diagonals inside of this image. We can also have a pattern for right diagonals, for vertical lines, for horizontal lines, and so on. And we compute this map that sort of says, well, you know, how, wh whether this pattern exists or how close to this pattern it does something exist in the image. And that's the way a convolutional neural net, which is one of the most popular sorts of machine learning algorithms for a number of different problems, but especially image, image um, analysis, uh, those work. 
um, those, the, all of those, that data is kind of put together from all the different patterns, and it, we come out with a weight that tells us how likely it is that there's an X in the image or an O in the image or whatever. Um, and you may have heard of something called a, this, this will be what we'll call a layer in a neural net, this kind of process for taking all of this data from all these different filters. And in general, we, we, we're often using what are called deep learning algorithms where we have many layers. So going back to our CAD example, the first layer might be finding diagonal lines and vertical lines and so on. The second layer might be finding something that looks kind of like ears or triangles. And the next layer, we might be finding something that looks more like a cat. So I'm kind of oversimplifying here, but you get the sense of why we have these different layers. And last, the machine, sorry, I just want to point out that at, at, NER, at, at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, um, we've run for many years supercomputers, so some of the fastest computers in the world, and we've used them for a lot of different scientific problems. If you look at a company like Google back in 1997, that was their computing platform. They do a lot of machine learning today, and they need a lot more computing um, than they had in 1997. So in fact, um, over an eight year period, the amount of computing it takes to run one of these machine learning algorithms increased by a factor of 300,000. So they now have big, huge buildings full of these kinds of computers. And actually, um, if you have anybody in your household that plays computer games, some of the same chips that we use in gaming are also used in both the, the Perlmutter computer, which is the most recent computer to arrive here at um, Berkeley Lab and, the, uh, um, and what are used inside of Google. So with that, I would like to end, and I'm going to hand it off to um, Ben Brown, who's going to talk about one of the examples of um, science and um, how that's used in science. And you can also look at more examples on the website at, at Berkeley Lab. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Kathy. OK, I'm going to be telling you about uh, AI for Ag, trying to build something that looks like a self-driving farm in the same sense that you have a self-driving car. Uh, for a more sustainable future. Now, by 2050, with the world's population growth, we're going to have to be able to provide 70% more food with about the same amount of cultivated land. And that's a real challenge. And it's a challenge we believe agriculture can help address. What I'll show you today, that, that AI uh, in agriculture can help address. And what I'll show you today is an example of how we're doing that and the kinds of methods and technologies that uh, this need to provide um, more, more food with the same amount of resources uh, is, is producing. However, there's a wrinkle. Uh, producing more food is great, but ag already counts for 10% of uh, our greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. Uh, and that's, that's a real issue. Uh, it's also important to note that soil carbon levels now, how much organic matter is in our topsoil, is around one, one and a half percent for much of the US, and that's down from 10%. Uh, in the 1940s prior to uh, the widespread industrial farming. So uh, to keep in mind that if we increase soil carbon by just 1% uh, uh, on one acre of topsoil, that removes 19 tons of atmospheric CO2. There are 1.1 billion cultivated acres in the US. So doing the math on this, a 1% increase in soil carbon in our topsoil would remove 20 billion tons of atmospheric CO2 or about half of our planetary global emissions. And if, if we could do this broadly and year in, year out, uh, we could really start to turn back the clock on uh, anthropogenic climate change. So there's another question parallel to feeding folks. At the same time, can we learn to drive agriculture toward carbon sequestration instead of carbon emissions. So instead of ag being responsible for 10% of emissions, can we get it to be responsible for uh, actually removing um, and, and turning back the clock on, on climate change? So let's, let, I'll show you how far we've gotten. So right now we've got yield uh, uh, that is our, our model for trying to build self-driving farms. And uh, we, we aim to do carbon, but yield is what we've got the data for now. And so what we do is we collect many, many, many layers of data uh, using satellites, using machines we drive across fields, using soil samples and chemistry. We collect many layers of data on every square meter, on every acre of uh, hundreds and thousands of field sites. We then use machine learning, in particular regression. We fit models to try and predict yield. Uh, this, this is a, a, a corn yield shown here to try to predict yield as a function of all of these layers. 
And what's novel and interesting about the type of machine learning we have to do here is it's not enough just to predict, right? We're not just saying, oh, there's a cat in a picture of cats. Uh, we, we have to understand why prediction is possible. And so there's a step after learning, after model fitting, where we ask, what are the really important features and what does the function look like? And shown here is an example uh, relating soil organic matter uh, and uh, available nitrogen in soil to yield. And what's really interesting is you see this huge step function around uh, 1.75 parts uh, per million or so organic matter that allows you to take much better advantage of the nitrogen as well. And that's a very important finding. That's a very important finding because it means that by increasing soil carbon, you also increase the value of your land, right? So there's multiple incentives to do it. Now, some of the relationships that we discover are even more surprising than the one I just showed you. Uh, this is a traditional plateau model that put, plots plant yield as a function of nutrients added. And in the plateau model, you start adding a nutrient like nitrogen and you can gain uh, you gain basically linearly yield for a while, but then it'll plateau and it'll plateau because it's now limited by another nutrient, in this case, phosphorus. Then you add more phosphorus and eventually you'll plateau. And no matter how much phosphorus you add, it's just going to plateau. It's not going to change after that. You have to do something else. That's not what we found uh, from machine learning. This model is based on human intuition and it's, it's from the 70s, but it's still how a lot of the industry thinks. And it's why over fertilizing is so common. It's why we have a dead zone in the Gulf. It's why we have algal blooms in our surface waters. Uh, this is a plot that relates phosphorus to potassium to yield. And what we see is that north of about 27 parts per million phosphorus, you actually lose yield and you lose it dramatically. This is soybeans and this is 10 bushels per acre, <clears throat> which is over 12% uh, of yield. So this is a really serious delta. Uh, based on this discovery, we've helped uh, the, the, uh, several farmers in the Arkansas Delta region uh, increase their profitability by 50%, both by increasing yield and by uh, reducing inputs. Uh, so it's a very interesting finding. Yet when we first discovered this about four years ago, I presented this at a USDA conference and I was booed <laughs> because it was, so, it was so surprising and it went so much against the established wisdom. But one of the advantages of using AI models like this and, and just doing data science without putting in too much uh, prior uh, assumption is that you can discover really interesting things like this. Now, uh, another challenge in ag is that everything is heterogeneous, right? This is real data from a field trial. Every one of these gray bars is an individual field trial of a particular nutrient that was added to the soil. And you can see that in some fields, it was actually detrimental. And in some fields, it was very helpful. This is an important thing to know because it means that nothing works the same way everywhere, right? Yet all the insights are in the tails. If you wanna understand how to optimize agriculture, you have to understand where a given amendment where a given nutrient or a given uh, action will create positive change versus negative change. So this is an example of a real field site, an 8,000 acre field site. And every color here represents a distinct and unique soil regime. And this model that gives this disaggregation of entire fields into distinct soil states is the same one I showed you that discovered the relationship between potassium and phosphorus. Uh, it can also show us where we expect things to behave the same or differently. For instance, in this orange regime, uh, we don't have time to go through what it means exactly, but in this orange regime, uh, nutrient A has a positive impact and B has a negative impact. And in this teal regime, nutrient A has a negative impact and B has a positive impact. This is real data and this is validated. Uh, and so now using this insight and using these models, we are able to drive in a much more automated way uh, ideal decisions on a farm to maximize return on investment. And we hope soon to maximize the sequestration of atmospheric carbon into our soils, increasing our land values. Uh, so that's the goal. Uh, uh, one of the big questions is, will emerging carbon markets provide additional economic forcing to alter practice? I sure hope they do. Uh, I thank you very much for your time. I'm now gonna stop my share and turn it over to my colleague, Herico Wainwright. Uh, from the earth sciences area. All right, Herico. Thank you. And I will share my screen. So I will talk about the application of machine learning uh, for watershed science and watershed water resources. And I'm from earth and environmental sciences area of Berkeley lab. So we, the scientists, we a bunch of scientists are working in this beautiful 
watershed in the Rocky Mountains. It is really beautiful place with many wildflowers. You see forest, mountains, and stunning views. But this is a very important place in the US. We call it the water tower of the West. So watersheds in the Rocky Mountains generate 85% of water in the Colorado River. And the Colorado River serves more than 40 million people in seven states from Arizona to California and Utah. Now, climate change is impacting and threatening the Rocky Mountain regions significantly that affects our water resource. For example, now snow is decreasing or transitioning to rain. So when we don't have snow, we get always droughts as we see now, right now in California. And we are expecting to have more, more droughts in the future. Plants like trees here, you see conifers and aspen trees, they actually they take up a lot of water and plants are a very important part of water cycle. When trees die during droughts, for example, or different species, different plant species come in, it actually affects water cycle and water resources in subsequent years. In addition, we have to characterize geology and groundwater because they dictate how much water we have in the later in the summer. Berkeley Lab leads the biggest watershed science project in the US. And we have the most instrumented watershed in the world. In watershed science, as you see in the, these pictures, we take a variety of measurements like snow measurements, um, plant sampling, uh, subsurface instrumentation for groundwater or uh, river water chemistry. We aim to understand how these components, geology, plants, snow, and others interact and govern how climate change affects water resources and also water quality. Now is a really exciting time for watershed science because there are so many different technologies available. We use drones a lot, you see in this picture, uh, we have new sensors and also we can image subsurface in a non-destructive way. So for example, there are satellite images available to observe plant productivity and snow coverage every few days. Uh, we call airborne geophysics. We put instruments to measure electrical conductivity of geo, geo subsurface so that we can characterize geology in 3D up to several hundred meters deep and the domain of tens of kilometers. We also have airborne based snow observatory. So we put laser instruments in the airplanes and measure snow depths at the watershed scale. So now we have such a large volume of very complex, very different types of data sets. So as Kathy mentioned, machine learning is really critical to extract all the key information from these data sets, as well as integrate these data sets for scientific discovery and improving water resources prediction. I will give you several examples of how we use machine learning in watershed science. So here we have historical satellite images. So you can see big snow year, a lot of snow coverage and low snow year. And this is particularly in June. Um, this is the primary growing season. At the same time, we have a historical record of snow and drought index. Then we can actually create the map of drought sensitivity, which means how ecosystem or trees respond to drought and low snow years. Then we can guide a uh, sense of placement where to collect samples, for, for example. This red region in this map is more uh, the sensitive area to the droughts. In addition, we have a series of different spatial data layers like elevation, plant types, and geology. And we can build a machine learning regression 
of the spatial data layers with the drought sensitivity map. Basically, we are establishing the relationship between drought sensitivity and spatial data layers, and we can identify why a particular location is vulnerable or what are the key factors. In this study, for example, we identified the elevation and aspect, north facing, south facing are of course important. Uh, surprisingly, we found that geology is also a key factor controlling drought sensitivity. As an, another example, now we have so many different spatial data layers and we can merge all these spatial data layers similar to what Ben has talked about. Um, into clustering approach. Uh, so we can put, use machine learning approach clustering and we can identify zones or the regions that have similar properties over elevation, geology, plant productivity, as you see in this left hand side, uh, left figures. Um, then we can identify covariate properties. For example, uh, conifer trees, tend to be in the north facing hill slope and steep hill slopes with hard, very hard bedrock. Aspen trees, on the other hand, tend to be more fractured and soft, soft bedrock with gentle hill slope. We call this donation or the identification of this region, uh, we, we call it as a zip code of the watershed science so that we can uh, guide where to do sampling and where to do experiment. And this is a powerful approach to compress dimensionality of spatial heterogeneity in a compressed system in a serial, series of zip code. Right now, we are integrating other new technologies like exascale computing, edge computing through machine learning into watershed science so that we can improve uh, water resource prediction as well as decision such as dam operation or water use in the agriculture field. And we also believe that adapting new technologies like these, also machine learning AI is critical to address water challenges in the world. So thank you very much. And um, I will turn off the screen share. Um, and my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Anna Sporok from Energies, Energy Analysis and Environmental Impact Division in, in the Berkeley Lab. Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Okay, let me get this set up. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about an application of machine learning for uh, behavioral science or decision science. Um, so my background is in energy economics and behavioral economics. And what that means is I study how and why people make energy related decisions, and also the equity implications of different technologies and policies. So um, there are a lot of different algorithms, different tools in the machine learning toolbox. And we've heard a lot about um, some of those already. A lot of them, some of the, the deep learning, for example, or identifying the cat photos or, the, um, or like Netflix telling you what it thinks you like to watch is really about accurate prediction. And the tricky thing about accurate prediction is um, it's not always, um, prediction doesn't always mean that you get to understand why something, why an outcome is that. And it, in my application, I would argue for a lot of these science examples in sciences, we really need to understand the why. Um, and I'm just giving this you know, little example here of you know, when we're thinking about policy, if there had a really sophisticated algorithm with a lot of information and happened to accurately predict an outcome that I didn't eat a donut, if you don't know why I didn't eat the donut, coming up with a policy intervention of giving me a donut may not necessarily make me better off. So, the kind of class of machine learning tools that I've found most readily useful for my work um, so far are the type, we've heard some examples already of these sort of data-driven categorization or classification clustering, for example, um, algorithms. So um, I'm gonna give an example of that in, in transportation behavior research. 
uh, one of the things that I really um, focus on is trying to understand the critical barriers to desired goals from a behavioral perspective. So taking an example of um, fighting climate change or decarbonizing transportation or our economy in general, we know that it's important to see if we can get people to drive their personal vehicles less, especially if they're internal combustion engines or gas vehicles. But there are a lot of reasons why people make choices that they, they make with, re with regard to their um, transportation decisions and understanding why can, can help us figure out how to accomplish this goal. And indeed, the, the ways, the policies or different kind of tools we might have to try to influence this outcome um, can have, based on why people are making those choices, can have big implications for equity and also feasibility or effectiveness of the different policies. So why do people drive? And who might be able to drive less and who might not? Um, so we know what we were trying to look at here is, is the factors associated with your life cycle stage. So we know from previous research that life cycle status really matters for transportation choices. What we mean by that is um, like whether you're a student or not, whether you're cohabiting or married or not, whether you have kids or not, whether you're working full time or not. But we really wanted to learn more about the capacity for flexibility in transportation choices by looking at patterns in sequences of life cycle status. So what do I mean by that? If you have two different people and you have a view over a course of their life, over you know, their age over time, and you see that for some points of their age, they were in certain states. They, they were in school, they were working, then they started, you know, maybe got married, living with a partner, and then they had kids. And people have different timing of patterns of how they do this. Well, it's the big challenge is to figure out how do you actually say that person A and person B are similar to each other in terms of this pattern or different? Because what we wanted to do is try to use clustering to classify people into groups of these are similar patterns and these are different. So what we did is we um, took advantage of an innovation from genetics where they developed what's called a um, edit distance metric. What that means is if you're comparing two sequences of genes with the same sort of categorical information of A, G, T, or C, an edit distance says the, few, the, the number of edits of a given gene sequence that needs to make it the same as another one is a, is a measure of the distance between those two things. So we use that in our context and a clustering al algorithm looking at these sequences. From our survey data, we had, if you jumped everyone in, this is what it looks like. They have um, this sort of on average, the pattern of how people were finishing school, starting their careers, living with a partner and having children. But we use the clustering technique for machine learning with that edit distance metric to basically create um, classification of five different kind of characteristic ways that people tended pro to progress through these life cycle stages that were very different in a lot of different ways. Um, I want to draw your attention to this group that we happen to name the have it alls. We name them that because these are a group that tended to have the timing of when they started their career be very closely um, aligned with the timing of when they were building their family and having children. And this is in contrast to some of the other groups. And we learned a lot of interesting things from this group. And one of the things we learned was this have it alls group relative to all the other group ramped up their car use significantly at each of their life cycle transitions. Uh, and they, that resulted in the highest rate of car use occurring the earliest of all the other cohorts that we identified and that level of car use persists thereafter. And we also learned that women in this have it alls group relied even more on vehicles than men. So this was really interesting because it starts to shed light on the type of underlying things people are deciding about themselves and their lives and their values that create a context for which the whether they can be flexible or not with trying to you know, encourage people to use different modes or, or make different choices. So thank you so much, and I'll um, turn it over to Kristen Person, from the um, who's the director of the Molecular Foundry in the material and the Materials Project. Great. So I'll be talking about the Materials Project. Um, I am a material scientist, and like most children, I didn't grow up thinking early on that I was going to be a material scientist. Um, it tends to be a subject that comes up much later in education. So I thought I'd spend a few seconds 
appreciating the materials that surround us on an everyday basis. I guess you all use touch screens, which are enabled by amazing transparent conductor materials. Today, we're blending in carbon composites into airplanes and the chassis of cars to make them more lightweight. They will run longer on the same amount of fuel. We use highly functional materials in security, in health, and we wouldn't have the communication age that we've taken real advantage of during the COVID-19 and otherwise um, our in information age. Um, we're also, of course, because we're a Department of Energy Lab, we're very concerned about clean energy and the future of clean energy. And that is very much tied to materials. The current photovoltaic panels that we have, they're great, but they could be even better. And they consist of many different functional materials, which each of them could degrade and, and become a bottleneck for future performance. You think about what happened in Texas, um, wind power is dependent on being up when the wind is blowing. And if your blades are full with ice, which could be mitigated by antiphobic or um, hydrophobic uh, coatings, your, your wind power would run better. Um, and of course, if we're gonna be reliant on intermittent energy resources, such as solar panels or wind power, we need to be able to store that energy when the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow and that's enabled by batteries, which is also very much a Mattel's um, game. So hopefully you're now very excited about materials, that we need new and better materials to meet the challenges that we're facing today. Um, so how are materials developed? Well, um, we tend to traditionally develop them by the so-called Edisonian design. And it was baptized after Edison because when he was looking for a material for his new invention, the light bulb, to be the filament in that light bulb, he ordered over 3000 materials from all over the world and he painstakingly tried each and every one of them. And it took him years. Unfortunately, because he was completely convinced this material had to be found in the carbon family of materials and because he was limited by time, even though he does seem very, very persistent if you look at this picture of him, he didn't find the best one. A decade later, a Hungarian group identified tungsten as being a better material than the one that Edison had spent so much time identifying. So this is a long game, finding good materials for a particular application with certain properties. So you got it, you were probably saying, well, you know, that was Edison. I was like a hundred years ago. You guys are much be doing this better today, right? So I thought I'd show you what Hollywood thinks we should be doing. This is Tony Stark right coming up table. with a new material for his protective device. He runs 400 and something simulations, which actually isn't that much. Dysprosium. And he picks up cool sounding elements like cerium and dysprosium. And then he does something. I don't know what he does. He synthesizes it in his hands and he tests this for elasticity or something. Maybe he does machine learning. Yeah. And then he puts it in his simulated body. Initiate. Initial biological compatibility. And he tests it for biocompatibility, which is really complicated. So he does all of this in like, I don't know, one minute. It's really cool. I would love to do it, but we're much closer still to Edison than to Tony Stark. So you're probably going like, well, again, machine learning, right? I've heard about machine learning and you're gonna talk about machine learning and we, we do, and we'd love to use more of it. But machine learning from my perspective is just like that awesome looking Ferrari that you'd love to drive, but you need fuel to do it. You need either traditional fuel or electricity depending on your Ferrari. And data is really the fuel of artificial intelligence and machine learning. You can't run that shiny algorithm without a lot of very good, robust and curated data. And when it comes to material science, in some cases, just like Kathy showed, we're actually drowning in data and we're trying to identify certain you know, features and pictures. But when it comes to correlating properties with the crystal structure and an underlying chemistry, we're very, very data sparse, very low in data. Even if you were to mine all of the existing publications out there, we are below 1% in coverage in terms of correlating a particular property like the band gap or the sum electronic structure or the thermoelectric properties of materials with their underlying crystal structure and chemistry. And this is where the materials project comes in and all of our beautiful capabilities at Berkeley Lab because we have learned how to compute materials properties fast, reliably using supercomputers and 
delivering that data to the world so that we can all be doing machine learning and accelerated learning and come up with materials faster than Edison. So to give you an example, um, if you were to mine all of the open literature and you were looking for the elastic tensor, which tells you how materials uh, perform or how they deform when you apply a load to them, you find about 200 materials with a, with a completely characterized elastic tensor. And that is really very low considering there is 100,000 materials, 200,000 different materials out there. So this is again, the sort of low one, below 1% 1 of coverage. Uh, during the time that the materials project has been up, so about a decade, we have calculated, and this is just one of the properties we calculated, uh, over 14,000 materials with an elastic tensor, full characterized elastic tensor. And this is not all of the materials that are out there. Again, we're sort of, we're, this is not that great. It's still like, it's two orders of magnitude better than the open literature, but it's still not all of the materials. So this is where machine learning comes in, because now we're at the point where we can start correlating crystal structure and chemistry to the elastic deformation that these materials might uh, experience under load. So if you go on the materials project, which is open to everybody, and you are interested in the elastic properties of material, which is very fundamental and very often used in devices, you need to know how your materials are going to perform, if they're brittle or not, and you find that the elastic tensor for your material hasn't been published yet or hasn't been calculated, what you can do is that you literally click on this button that says predictions, and up comes our machine learned uh, guess, best guess for what the elastic properties of your material is. So we are experiencing an increasingly data hungry world. Uh, the materials project sees, uses, the, basically gives data to the whole world and every day on average, one paper per day cites the materials project for machine learning and for some sort of insight when it comes to materials. And other groups not affiliated with us are predicting novel materials for energy efficient lighting, for advanced coatings, and we're very, very happy to contribute to this. Uh, we have over 190,000 registered users, rapidly approaching 200,000. We're used all over the world and we deliver millions of requested data items per day, up to 50 million uh, data records uh, on certain days uh, to this very, very um, excited community. And with that, I thank you for your time. And I'm very excited to. Um, Introduce our next speaker, Jamie Sebian. Jamie, take it away. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Kristen, very, very much. So I'd like to talk a little about mathematically based machine learning for understanding scientific experiments. Um, <clears throat> we are a Department of Energy laboratory and there are a large number of facilities throughout the Department of Energy complex and their massive investments, which really promise to introduce and open the door to all sorts of new science, advanced light source, advanced photon source, LCLS, the molecular foundry, uh, the light source in the foundry here at Berkeley, supercomputers, as well as NERSC, et cetera. That one's at Berkeley as well. And these are massive instruments. And the trick here is to transform the data that comes from these experiments into understanding. Now, as experiments become more complex and they happen more rapidly and they generate more data and they become autonomously driven, as Kathy mentioned, we can collect lots of data and store it, but how do we make sense of it? Now, this talk really measures your age. Some people will know what those yellow books are at the bottom, others won't. Those are phone books which are collecting data, but how do we actually transform it into understanding? There was a wonderful Wall Street Journal article about a year ago which said big data doesn't interpret itself. And what we really need is to build the mathematics that allows us to understand what there is. What sort of meaning are we looking for? Well, we want to accurately analyze the results that come from complex experiments. On the left, that first picture you're seeing is a beam at LCLS at Stanford, which is intersecting a spinning molecule and trying to look at patterns that it like shadows, figure out what there is. How do we extract new information hidden in experimental data? What you're looking at here is cryo-EM, where you freeze a material, and then you, typically a biological material, and then you examine it through tomography to figure out what there is. How do you do self-driving optimal experiments? And I'll talk about that in a little more detail. How do you actually make these things much more efficient and move much faster? How do you do on the fly data triage? We're collecting so much data. How do you know if you've set up your experiment correctly or it's a big disaster and you spend all night collecting something in your samples in the wrong place? 
And how do we rapidly do experiment with minimal intervention? This is to decrease downtime and to increase efficiency. Machine learning is a part of these challenges. Now, let me define machine learning. Machine learning is an amalgamation of a whole host of applied mathematics and statistical techniques, approximation theory, adaptive metrics, feedback analysis, model-based methods, energy minimization. It's a whole host of things which go under the title of machine learning. To try to tackle some of these challenges of turning data info into information, the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory has built CAMERA. And CAMERA is the Center for Advanced Mathematics for Energy Research Applications. And the goal of CAMERA is actually to connect and develop state-of-the-art mathematics and use it to understand the data that comes from experimental facilities. So I'd just like to take a second to give you two examples. <clears throat> the first is machine learning for experiment. And this is work done by Marcus Nowak at LBL. So the challenge, <clears throat> how do you decide which experiment to perform to get the most information as quickly as possible? Let me describe to you sort of a standard approach. You have a beam, it intersects the substance, you pick up a shadow or the images that come out, and you then stay up all night waiting for the experiment to finish. Once you do that, you guess which experiment to perform next. You then move everything around to set up a new experiment, and then you do it again in a slightly different configuration. The idea of using machine learning and AI for optimized experiments is to optimally choose the wisest and the next best experiment to perform. So this replaces the idea, which you just saw, with a different loop. You do the experiment, you automatically analyze what's come out of it. You then make a very smart decision as to what to do next. This is an algorithm called GPCAM. And then you use robotics to set the whole new experiment up. Just to give you an idea, at Brookhaven, the beamline utilization increased from 20 to 80% with a six-fold decrease in the number of experiments, just to get the same information. Now, let me give you a graphic to give you the hint. Green dots are where you've done an experiment. And on the basis of that, you build a model which then tells you, looking at critical points, you should go do another experiment over here. And then you should do an experiment here. And then you should do an experiment here. Of course, this is all in a very high dimensional space. So solving these problems are quite sophisticated, but it's basically guiding you to the right spot. One way to think about this is, if I asked you, what is the elevation of various spots in the United States? You could systematically walk every 20 feet and measure, or you could do some experiments that will soon enough tell you, I need to pay some attention around the Rockies and the Appalachians. This software has been used in multiple places. One, for example, is at a beam line at the advanced light source. And there, it actually reduced the amount of data you needed by 50 times and still get the same actual information. It's also used in lots of other places, at NIST, at Brookhaven, and neutron sources, and Slack. It's all over the place. And this idea of self-driving laboratories really is a future that's coming quickly. The second example are automatically segmenting and recognized biological images through machine learning. So as Kathy alluded to, the current state of machine learning is really good for natural images. So there's a vast database and millions of expensive, inexpensive and annotated images. There are a lot of cat pictures out there. The situation is different for scientific, in particular biological images. There's very few of them. They're expensive to collect and there's no information and typically manual analysis is required. Standard machine learning methods, those deep neural networks you heard about, they have a lot of difficulty. The networks are complicated. They need millions of parameters and they're prone to overfitting. They need supercomputers to minimize the weights. They find fake, or over, fake minima and they struggle and we don't have millions of annotated biological images. So instead we went down a different road. We invented something called mixed scale dense convolution networks. The punchline here, for those of you slightly in this business, is the architecture of these allows connectivity between all the images. So all that world of deep layers and multi, multiple, multiple connections evaporate. If you do that, you can use far less weights and compute this far quickly on workstations. So let me give you one example. Using these ideas, here we do some cryo-EM. On the left is a raw slice. If we 
manually train on 20 slices, we can pull out this structure. This is a toxoplasmosic uh, experiment, annotate them all, and pull out 3D reconstructions for many images you've never seen. And the final point to make is good mathematical ideas can be applied to wholly different fields. So Kathy alluded to magic. Let me give you a definition of something that's not magic. Suppose you owned a crummy camera. And suppose you also could borrow a really good camera. Then you could take pictures of something with both of your cameras and then train this technique so that in, you could take crummy images and instead of needing the good camera, you could rebuild good results from the crummy one. The reason to do this is it reduces exposure time, et cetera. Finally, let me end with many people are part of this work and contact me and I'd be happy to connect you back up. So let me turn it back over to Jen. Thanks so much, Jamie. And thanks to Kathy, Ben, Haruko, Anna, and Christine for their presentations. Let me actually invite them all to turn their cameras back on along with my colleague, Dan Croats and we'll begin our Q&A session. Um, and I want to actually start with a question that came in for Ben. Uh, the question we got is, is computer vision or satellite imagery really promising for solving agriculture related challenges? Or does the real information only usually come from field studies? That is a great question. And that is a slide I took out in the interest of time. <laughs> uh, satellite imaging and remote sensing is very valuable to us. We use it for a lot of different things. One of the things we use it for is for trying to take very sparse soil measurements and uh, extend them across the field scale, impute them, right? Guess the values in areas where we don't have them. Uh, the most valuable measurements of soil biogeochemistry are destructive, right? So you, can, you, you can't make them again in a time course or anything else. And so being able to do things non-destructively and remotely, uh, is, it, it's really not an option yet. You have to, you have to solve that. Um, and, uh, and also using remote sensing to optimally select new samples in the same sort of way Jamie was telling you, right? The, that, that same process you can apply to uh, optimally select additional uh, soil samples uh, using remote sensing. So yeah, very valuable, very valuable. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. And we have another question from the audience. Um, are there, and this is for Anna, are there machine learning relevant research questions that you believe will be important uh, due to the changes that families in the U.S. have experienced uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, that's a great question. I would say yes, because you know machine learning basically is a toolbox that can be coupled with a lot of other toolboxes to answer a lot of critical questions. We know that there was huge impacts from the pandemic on multiple fronts, um, a lot of which had a lot to do with equity, just to say. And so, you know, I can't necessarily say right now what the specific application is because I think there would be a multitude of them. Um, so I think it just is a matter of, you know, people coming up with the really fascinating questions to ask and pulling those tools in to, to grapple with them and figure out how to make lives better. Great, thanks, Anna. Um, you know, so we've got a question that I think I'd like to maybe toss out to the group. Um, what what are the ethical implications we should be thinking about when working with AI and machine learning? You know, for example, um, how do we ensure that biases aren't built into algorithms that are used for applications with broad societal impact? So um, maybe I'll start and just say that since I'm also um, at the Berkeley campus, that it's one of the things we worry about a lot in, in teaching students about machine learning. And, um, and it's a very active area of research in machine learning. So I think there are a few different pieces of that. One of them is privacy. Um, and there are some really interesting techniques for doing machine learning where you don't have to share all the data. That's called federated machine learning, where different different people at different sites, like a different a bank could be just providing a part of the, the machine learning algorithm on their own data and then not sharing the data with everybody else, but other banks could all aggregate their models together. So those are, there's privacy preserving techniques. There's also techniques for computing on data when it's encrypted so that you don't have to really expose the raw data. I think in terms of ethics, we worry a lot about bias in the algorithms and bias in the data. And um, there are techniques that we use even in scientific problems. One of our, um, somebody from the physics area was talking about using those even in analyzing really fundamental physics data from particle experiments that you need to 
um, have algorithms that are not biased to the data. Just to give a, a kind of a concrete example of bias in science, in, uh, or even a pure science discipline like that, if you've got a telescope in the Southern Hemisphere and a telescope in the Northern Hemisphere, they're going to bias differently the way you see the images of the universe. And so you do, and, and so it's a, it's a really active um, area and one I think that's very important. Let's jump in with one more thing I want to say. I had this really great quote and I can't find it, but it's something like we should let the data speak for itself when it can clean itself, which is that, um, you know, we think about the idea that these data driven techniques can just, you know, there's these emerging insights we can get from them, which is true, but they're only as good as the inputs that you put into it. And you have to be really careful about, you know, the choices that get made in preparing those inputs or selecting them. And it makes a big difference with those biases. If I can just add to that, it's not simply only the data. All machine learning algorithms can, contain with the, within them statements and suppositions about what's closest to what, what the metrics are, what the model is, et cetera. And those are incredibly revealing. And ignoring those basically means you've baked inside it your own preconditions about what's similar and what's not similar. Data doesn't solve itself. Thank you. Um, another, oh. um, go ahead. Actually, Haruka, did you want to chime in there for a oh. second? Yeah, I, I want to um, add um, one comment about privacy and remote sensing. So now we can see like your garden or the plants of the, your garden, how, how well they are growing, for example. So because we have location, we can find other data like elevation, topography aspect at your garden. But at the same time, it's there is a kind of people worry about privacy issue. Uh, so like finding different data set at the location, or maybe we should remove that location from the data set, for example, when we share, that's an active area of discussion in environmental science and agriculture. Thanks, Haruko. Uh, let's do one more question. Dan, go ahead. Yeah, so in our, our final minutes here, beyond the, the machine learning applications discussed today, what, what applications are you most excited about that has the potential to have broad impacts in the world that we live in? So I'll just mention a couple outside of the kind of basic science space that we work on here at Berkeley Lab. Um, we're on campus, we're looking at use of machine learning and social justice. Um, machine learning algorithms are being used for things like bail bond setting, but even for used in various ways in um, evidence and how to ensure that those, those techniques, if they are being used, are being used in a way that is, is fair, is um, something that we're, we're quite interested in and doing, doing research on and working across disciplines. So that's maybe the last thing I'll say. A lot of these exciting areas that you heard about today, but also these other areas um, require expertise from a lot of different disciplines, mathematicians like Jamie and um, computer scientists like me and uh, domain scientists like many of the other people here on the, on the panel. I, I, I would end with, I think that um, machine learning has been spectacular. Think about the fact that you type something into translation and it appears translated or automatic, you know, live captioning and all the rest. The line I often use is machine learning is wonderful when the price of being wrong is small. And you need to be really careful when the price of being wrong is large. And I think that edict is important. And Kathy's talking about really thinking about it hard when the price of being wrong is large. And I think that's incredibly valuable. Thanks. And I, you know, Ben, you've got to leave uh, soon. I don't know if you've got any thoughts on this last question. We'd love to hear from you if you do. Um, I, I thought that those were great answers. And I, I do have to jump. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Thank you so much. Uh, um, yeah, you know, uh, for those who don't mind sticking around for another minute, I thought we got one more question that I think might be interesting for the students who are on this call. Um, you know, for any any students who find machine learning interesting but aren't sure how they can be involved, does anybody have suggestions for the skills or courses they could learn in order to increase their chances of working with machine learning in the future? Well, maybe I'll. I'll 
first of all, start with um, as a high school student, uh, you know, take math, learn math. <laughs> it's really useful in a lot of different ways, um, whether you're in, in machine learning, but in other disciplines and is great foundation for many different fields. Material science, even if you don't know that's what you want to do, I think later you'll find that the math is useful. Um, I, I, you know, we teach a, an introductory data science course called Data 8, um, and there are, it, it is available online. Um, it's Data 8X at UC Berkeley, and it teaches basic um, ideas about how you think about analyzing data and what data means and some of these uh, basic statistical techniques, as well as a little bit of programming, things like that. So I wouldn't worry too much about the specifics of programming languages and things. I would um, just sort of learning the basic foundations is really helpful, though. So I Kathy and I are sort of trading compliments of disciplines. Um, she just said math is important. I think learning to program is important because you don't want to just use packages of other people's things. You want to be able to look inside and see how it works, because that's where you'll find the assumptions and the decisions and the models that are inside these things. I think this is crucial. Thanks, Jamie and Kathy. And Haruko, you wanted to? Yep, go ahead. Um, I, I actually have many students from environmental science, particularly, who originally didn't have any um experience or skills in machine learning and they learn machine learning in my group i would say that the bar of entry to machine learning is very low there are so many online tutorials and courses online but sort of try to understand why you get this answer um, machine learning tools are built on math i agree with kathy so <laughs> sort of Using machine learning, it's kind of easy, uh, but understanding why, um, I think that math and sort of, um, yeah, fundamental math physics are very important, I would say. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Anna? Can I add to that just to say, you know, she's saying math, but also just like, you know, the domain knowledge of the thing that you're interested in studying. You know, full disclosure, I am not the machine scientist. I am not the data scientists on our team. So, you know, I work with brilliant people who have much more facility in those particular techniques, but I bring a domain knowledge that helps form, you know, the, the types of questions we want to ask with it and how it can integrate into this question of finding out, you know, why, you know, the, the outcomes are what they are. And so, you know, even if it's not your field and you're interested in a particular other field, but you are interested in these techniques, you know, collaboration for me with this wonderful woman, Ling Jin, who's brilliant and has, you know, basically driven all of the, the just like, you know, the, the data science aspects of the work that I've done. Um, that's also, you know, you can always do that and it's great. All good advice. Thank you for those answers. And thanks to folks for sticking around a little bit past one o'clock. The, uh, the event is now at an end. And before we close, I just wanna thank all of our panelists one more time for their presentations and also thank the audience for tuning in and for asking great questions and for your interest in the lab. Um, if you have any interest in staying up to date on what's happening at the lab, you can visit us at www.lbl.gov or follow us on social media at Berkeley Lab. With that, have a wonderful Friday afternoon. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>